Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. I am happy to start our program today. Um, I'm a little early, just a few seconds, actually, but um, we're going to get this program started. Today is going to be a powerful day as we talk at Coffee Tea, you and me, about the last of the seven elements of, or habits, I should say, of the Roundtable way. For most of you who are not familiar with the Roundtable, the Roundtable is an organization that my partner and I, Darren Marcourt, founded a few years back, um, literally to teach and to train entrepreneurs and business professionals on the skills and the science associated with networking. We had no clue when we first started this organization what we would end up with. We had no clue the benefits that we were going to be able to drive to our members and our partners and our friends. And it's been such a tremendous opportunity um, that we're now ready to expand and grow. And we're trying to create a series of understandings and wisdoms that you know are available for everyone to really just take advantage of and, 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 and take the lessons that we've learned and come up with through the round table. So I want to talk to you today about something I think is unique and super special, and that is the seventh principle, the seventh habit of the Roundtable Way. Um, if you can go back and look at the, the current programs that we've done uh, in the last couple of weeks, have all been leading up to this one. This is part four of a four part series. And so the last part of this series today, we're going to talk about and get into and take a deep dive into what continuous learning is and how continuous learning works. Why you should think about it as a profession, as a person, and how does it apply to all that you do in your life and in your learning? Now, obviously this is the seventh habit of the round table. And it's a very important habit for us because as we pursue and study and embrace the art and science of networking, our members, our friends, have to really, really learn um, how to do it, how uh, the skills associated with um, doing it well. There are nine specific skills that we know that when you master these skills and you master them in order and you learn how to use them and you learn how to um, develop techniques and strategy around those skills, then you can become the kind of person that attracts the right people around you for whatever reasons you need them to be. That might be business development, that might be structural achievement, that might be something that you want to try to accomplish, anything you want to be, do, and have in your life, in your business, in your practice. It's important for you to know how to, as um, one of my favorite authors would say, win friends and influence people. If you can't do that, um, if you can't develop that skill, who, who wrote that book? Dale Carnegie, right? Um, if you can't develop those skills and those talents, and there are many uh, lectures and, and books and tapes and everything that's there for you, but in order for you to truly grow as a networker, you're going to have to let experience teach you a lot, and you're going to have to practice a lot, rehearse a lot with and engage with people. It's like that in most areas that you're going to want to learn and grow in because the efforts and the knowledge come from people who pre-existed you, who already got there before you, who learned something that you need to learn so that you can then innovate and create on top of what they've already delivered and taught to you. It's so good to see my friends are here today. Um, my boy Scott's in the audience and Nancy's out there again. That's wonderful, guys. I'm so happy that you are here. And um, I definitely want to give you a little shout out a little later on in the program as we get more people into the audience. Um, the rules are for today, like as always, if you have a question, please put it in the chat. Please put it in the chat. Please engage. Um, that's how I know that what we're talking about, what we're doing is meaningful, has relevance to people. And it's how I know that um, this is something that is worthwhile, is worth continuing in some way, shape or form, whether we're going to go back in person or we're going to um, continue to do this online. I think we're going to continue this online even if we go back to doing it in person. Um, so just let's just let you guys know about that. And um, we're going to get our program started formally, but just know that as you come in, if you haven't already, please make sure that you um, 
put your information in the chat as to where you are from, maybe how you met me, and any information that you want people to know about you. So if you want people to be able to contact you or find an opportunity, if something's going on that you want to do, um, go ahead and put that in the chat. As a matter of fact, here's a good one. If there's something in your life that you know that you could learn more about and it would make a big difference, and I need you to put what it is, but I want you to think about what that thing might be and I want you to think about what you might be, do, or have as a result of learning it. And while I'm taking a quick commercial break, I want you to go ahead and put that information in um, the chat. That'll be a good exercise for us to engage in because maybe we can help some people achieve some things. I mean, we can help each other. So go ahead and put that information in the chat and we will keep this party going right after these messages. <laughs> I really never get tired of that little video introduction that my good friend put together for me. I love it because, um, you know, when you think about it, what we're doing here is we're giving you the tools that you need to keep your machine running. We're giving you the tools that we need to keep you moving forward, your, your goals moving forward, your business moving forward, your vision moving forward. And it's very, very important. Um, I don't even know what the series that we're going to talk about later is going to be about. But this is the last of a four-part series that we created called The Roundtable Way. For those of you all who are not familiar with it, um, I'm going to repost the document about The Roundtable Way. I'm thinking about it right now in um, the drive, if I can figure out how to get to it. Look at that, Marvin. Sometimes you're a pretty sharp fellow. And I'm going to drop that document right into our chat so everybody can know what we've talked about previously and how that's shaping the current conversation. So let's just pull that up and then find out. We need to share it. That's great. That's great. We'll copy the link. Yes, yes, yes. And back to the thing. And there we go. Boom. There it is. The document that you have in front of you is a live version of the Roundtable Way. You can go ahead and download that onto your hard drive or whatever you want. Read it at your leisure. Um, come back to it if you can pull it up in um, either on YouTube or on Facebook. It's right there for you. But this is the seventh habit. The seventh habit is really about continuous learning. Um, there's a lot of habits that networkers need to embrace um, to really, really be masterful at their craft, to really get it, to understand it, to embrace it, and really use it. And I've talked about that. Those habits that are specific to the roundtable are useful everywhere. It's not just that you know we're doing them at the roundtable. They, they should be done everywhere. And so continuous learning is something that you should adopt personally as a professional, but as well as um, if you're a member of the round table, there are certain things and certain habits and certain certain processes that you should also adopt. That's why we called it the round table way. So your continuous learning process is critically important to your success. And I'm working on, I've done, done, done some, some deep studies on this. Um, I've looked at, you know, continuous, love, continuous learning from so many different angles. We've looked at it from uh, uh, the, 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 the ancient text, uh, we've looked at it from the Bible's point of view. You know, what have you learned? What do we learn from you know, ancient wisdom? What we've always always talked about and thought about. So we've got some ideas I want to flesh out with you from those things. Ten top lessons that you get from, from the Bible, right? Um, so we got about ten quotes that we pulled up about learning and how you can use th those things to start to shape your mind. We're going to talk about um, how you can use learning to increase your brain health and what it's going to mean to you to increase your brain health. And we're going to talk about what, what is continuous learning and why is it important? Why is it important to you as a person? Why is it important to any organization you belong to, whether you're a team member or you're a leader in that organization? And we're going to talk about um, the golden shepherd concept. And finally, we're going to share with you 
some exercises that if you will do, I promise you, you will be on the road to tremendous success. Not only that, we're going to share a couple of facts and features about what's going on in the learning world today and what um, science and business have studied and thought about and produced when it comes to this kind of good stuff. And so, like I said, if you have any questions about your learning or strategies if you've used in the past that you want to share, could make sure that 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 you put that in the chat. Um, make sure you put it in the chat if it's something that you want to know more about, something that you want to learn more about. You'd be surprised um, how many of us have already embarked upon certain things. We might be able to share some uh, information from you. We can put links in the chat for you. We can do all kinds of good stuff. Um, but it's also important that um, you're able to start to think through your own developmental program. How do you put together your own learning program? You know, what is the pace you want to go at? How how much time do you want to spend? And you know, what do you want to be able to do and get out of it? Because learning for the sake of learning, yes, can be fun, but we're talking about a strategic learning in this point. We're talking about, you know, learning purposefully and how important that can be for you. So let's dig right in. First of all, let's let's put a framework behind what we think learning might be and what, what continuous learning might be um, on a personal level, right? On a personal level, continuous learning is nothing but an ongoing self-motivated persistent persistence that you have in acquiring knowledge, competencies in order to expand your skill set and develop future opportunities. It forms a part of your personal professional development and in an effort to avoid stagnation to reach your fullest potential. That's a mouthful, right? You think about it. If you don't grow, if you don't learn, you don't grow. And if you don't grow, you don't move forward as society is moving forward, as time is moving forward. You know that old saying, time waits for no man? I mean, there is nothing um, more, I would think, tragic than living a life and not being able to keep pace with the growth of the universe, of the world, of society, at least keep pace. You know, because when you start falling behind, there really isn't a whole lot you can do to be useful, you know, because basically somebody else has to keep helping you to keep moving. Um, and I understand that there is something that happens with all of us as we get older. We don't have the ability to keep up. But let's 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 keep and mature that ability and let's make sure that we we're strengthening those resources um, to the best of our abilities as long as we can. Um, the word retirement to me is, is is like a dangerous word because I can't see myself ever really just doing nothing. You know, I always want to be doing something of value. I always want to be providing value to others. I always want to be sharing <clears throat> what I know, what I have, who I am with others. I want to be relevant. I want to be meaningful. I want to be significant. Right. As does as do most human beings. The studies already show that. Right. So we've, we've talked about that on many, many times. So let's talk about what some of the ancient text says about learning. And, you know, I'm not going to quote you chapter and verse or anything like that. But uh, when when this document is finished, I will post it to the public site and I will make sure that you have a uh, make sure it's available for everyone. But I'm still working on the on the document, but I've collected lots of of data. So I'm going to share with you some of the big things that I've collected, right? There's 10 top elements or 10 top ideas that you might get from the ancient text, the wisdom text, the Bible, or any other scriptural um, that you can think of that's probably going to say something similar or not the same exact thing, right? So think about it. Um, the first, and I, and I basically pulled the most, most popular text or quotes from the Bible, and then I gave a little interpretation of it um, so that, you know, it matches what we what we're thinking about today in terms of what what's universal and what's understandable today. So um, this is not a, a a lesson a lesson on Christian doctrine as much as it is a lesson on um you know what ancient things that our whole entire Western society is has been thinking about and talking about and writing about and is based on um, in many different ways. So first thing first um, about learning, if you wish to become understanding and wise, you must continue to pursue learning. If you want to be the kind of person that can claim a level of competency and a level of wisdom 
in any area of expertise, then you must pursue continuous learning because that thing, whatever that thing is, is constantly changing. The information is constantly changing. The ideas and, con and concepts around the world associated with it are constantly changing. New perspectives are coming into the canon, right? Um, and it's very, very important that if you wish to be wise and then to stay wise about something, that you continue the process of growth and learning. Number two, um, you should never deny yourself wisdom and instruction. What does that mean? There's information out there that you need to acquire to live your life, to run your business, to grow as a person professionally and personally. And when you say to yourself, I'm done with that learning thing. I can't grow anymore. I can't, I'm not gonna pursue any more new information about anything. You're basically relegating yourself to obscurity. You're basically resigning yourself to get passed by, by the whole entire universe as it continues on its trajectory forward, wherever it's going, whatever's happening, you're not gonna be a part of it and your legacy won't be a part of it either because you will be a relic of history. You will be a thing of the past the minute you decide, you decide to deny yourself the wisdom and instruction of others, you know, so that you can grow. Because, you know, like I said, others have written books, they have um, design programs, they have explored new worlds and new territories and new opportunities out there, and they have something to share. If not how they won, what mistakes they made is there for you to understand and you for and you and for you to learn. And so it's important that, you know, not only do you and I love that part of, of, of this this proverb. Because it's not just your responsibility to. Gain wisdom and instruction for yourself, it's also your responsibility to give wisdom and instruction to others and by doing verifying that what you what, what you have to teach and what you have to share also has value and meaning. So I think it's very, very important that you do that. Um, that's a process, a part of growing and sharing and learning and growing and sharing and learning and growing and learning and sharing and keeping the process going as you grow and become stronger and stronger and stronger. The third uh, lesson we learn from the Bible is to use all of your resources to learn, all of your senses, all of everything you have that you can put into fully engage in comprehending and mastery and awareness and perception of whatever it is that you need to learn. Look at it from as many different pr perspectives as possible. Um, give it everything you got, put your whole self in. You can't half-heartedly learn something. You can, but it'll be slow. It'll be slow, it'll be painful, and it's already a slow and painful process. It's already um, very difficult for most people to acquire new information. And just, and we're gonna get into a little bit, little bit of a neuroscience here, but here's a good time for me to tell you this. Your brain, as you learn, is new things, right? It's taking up a tremendous amount of energy out of your life and your business. And so if you learn it well, what happens is your brain already builds sort of um, synopsis and it, it, it connects to resources that are already there and continues to strengthen the neural pathways to that information so you can access that information faster and become more efficient because your brain wants to be efficient. It wants to not use up so much energy. So when you learn something, you learn it well, it builds the resources necessary for you to recall and for you to retain and for you to remember how to access that information. So it's critically important as you learn new things, new knowledge, new skills, new tactics, new that you practice, that you rehearse, that you do everything you can to lock it in so that your brain can, it's like riding a bike, right? You never forget it. So it's always there for you. You can always recall it because if you can't, it becomes very difficult to innovate and create on top of that. We'll get to that a little bit later. All right, number four, no matter your level of mastery, you must embrace and understand that you are never, ever finished. No matter what level 
of mastery that you have in your craft, in your business, in your industry, in your hobbies, in whatever it is you're learning, the roles that you play. You know, um, I'm hopefully going to play the role of a father until I pass because my only child should still be here. Right. If that works out the way it's intended to work out, then that's what's going to happen. So I'm always going to be learning how to be a better father. Always, because that role is not going away. I'm always going to be learning how to be a better husband. That role is not going away. I'm always going to be learning how to be a better coach because I'm never retiring and I'm always going to be learning. And so I think about that. You know, it's important that no matter how what levels I get, no matter what awards I get, no matter what progress I make, I'm never finished. I'm always going to be learning more and better and getting better because once I'm at the top of my game, I don't want to relinquish that spot. I want to stay at the top of the game, not because I'm trying to hoard the talent, because I want I want to share everything. I, I, in fact, I learn so that I can share. Um, in fact, so I learn when I learn something, I learn it really well because I want to share it. It's, it's critically important, and it's, it's important to how, how I see myself uh, as a valued member of our society. If I'm hoarding the knowledge, if I'm hoarding the information, if I'm hoarding the abilities and the, and the techniques and all that kind of stuff, then I'm not going to feel too good about my contributions that I'm making to the world. So it's very, very important. Number five, find the universal text that profits your soul. And what I mean by that is, there is no denying in my mind the spiritual component that makes all of us work. So, you know, um, we all have the four concepts that you think about, right? Your heart, your mind, your soul, your body, right? These are all things that work together to make us us. And that spiritual component and whatever, whatever text or original material that you can find that nurtures that spiritual component, you need to be about the business of learning that. Um, I'm not going to tell you, you know, what it is for you, because it might be the Torah, it might be the Quran, it might be the Book of Mormon, it might be the Bible, it might be any type of um, uh, mastery that you may have uh, have been written from uh, the Asian scriptural texts. It might be the Buddha that you learn from. Uh, you might learn um, the the ancient art of of uh, whatever, <laughs> you know. But when you think about it, all the universal texts, all of the the old ancient what we call what we would call religious texts tends to have the same universal themes and they're great for learning they're great for you to grow as a person and the way it profits you where it profits you is it gives you confidence it gives you character it gives you something that other people when they look at you they go mm, why are you so rock solid why are you so sound in your thoughts and your ideas and your principles and the things that give you peace and harmony and joy and balance. What is it about you that's so special? Because you learn to master the ideas of old, the ideas that we've always had um, that have, have, have been there for us. And you've learned to interpret them and update them in a new and realistic way that works for today. Right. That's what you, that's how you know you really got something special when you can take what it was, is old uh, and maybe outdated or, 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 or whatever that is. When you when you look at it and bring breathe new life into it and make it relevant for now, uh, it doesn't become relevant for now until you make it relevant for now, until you interpret it and figure out a way for it to to live in, in today's universe, you know, in today's world. You don't just throw out the ancient wisdom, the ancient text, you learn from it, right? You grow from it. And that's very, very important because it will help you become someone that's of value, someone that can profit today from that ancient wisdom. And it takes a bit of work. It takes a discipline. It takes your, your ability to do what's next, what's number seven, which wrestle with the ancient text and the scriptures. Do this on purpose and do this regularly if you want to develop integrity and pride. Um, if you want to have something that you know you feel is truthful, you want to have something that you feel is is rock solid, is evidentiary of some ideas and some concepts, and you want to be clear about your source of, of that pride, there is no greater source than the spiritual source. There is no greater source than um, the universal idea of soul and how uh, it stands up to 
um, your character in today's vernacular, right? So you have to really figure out how you make all that work, but it's something that's worth your, your worthwhile for you to pursue, not in order to debunk, but in order to find value, to find faith, to find hope, to find charity and kindness and love. Um, and that's what I find when I read the Bible quite a bit. So think about that for yourself and what that means for you. But I will tell you, if you wrestle with the scriptures, no matter where they come from, no matter what they are, you're going to develop a sense of hope and pride and integrity in yourself. Number eight, when you teach others, right, you want to be as comprehensive and holistic as possible. It's the same thing um, that comes from whenever you um, want to learn. You want to learn from a comprehensive and holistic point of view. You also want to teach from a comprehensive and holistic point of view. You don't want uh, your your protégés or your students or your mentees, I hate that word, but you don't want them to feel like um, they've been robbed and they go and they learn some lesson about your life, your industry or whatever that is from someone else because you weren't able to fully give them what they needed to feel confident. You know, without question, you don't want them to have to question. You don't want them to have to doubt. You don't want them to have fear. They don't know enough because you want them to be encouraged and you want them to be um, to feel like they have what they need to move their lives and themselves forward. If they don't, that's going to be a significant problem. Right. Number nine. This is about understanding early that the discipline required to truly develop a love for learning has to happen as early in life as is possible. Now, it's never too late to develop this discipline, but I will say it's easier to develop while you're young. It's easier to develop when you have others to look towards, other teachers, your parents, your elders, that watch how they learn, watch how they grow, and then you're probably gonna figure out how to emulate them long enough to embrace the habits required that you need to break. But let's just say you didn't have that. Let's just say you didn't have people to look at and, and, and watch uh, their learning style and develop in a way that, 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 that cr it created for you a love of learning, a love of development, right? Um, my wife uh, had uh, her parents who read the paper like every day together in the morning, and she would see them reading the paper every day uh, for breakfast every day, right? And she developed a learning or, or a love for reading the paper and learning from what she can learn or reading books. Or she read, they read books. They didn't have a lot of television and stuff like that in the world. And for her to this day, she has the love for learning. We have um, books all over the place, you know, some we've read, some we haven't read, but it's an important thing. And we've passed that same love on to our child because she grew up watching us. She grew up watching us you know, buy books, stay, spend time in the bookstore, read the books that we bought. She saw that. And so that that became a part of her life and a part of her love of learning. So it's very, very important that, you know, you discipline yourself, you discipline others around you and you show them the work required in order for you to learn. Don't just learn it, keep it to yourself and then pop up and go, ah, look what I got. You know, I'm, I'm like, no, no, no. Bring somebody else along the way. Mentor somebody else. They need to see the discipline. They need to they need to see and feel the discipline required um, to to do it. So they develop the habits. So they they can respect the habits. And instead of sitting around um, surfing the net all day, unless they're surfing the net for something to learn, right? <laughs> surfing the net and just going out on social media and hanging out and playing with people online. That that has a place. Don't get me wrong. But it's not like um, you're going to grow a lot from that. And you, you're not going to master anything. Uh, except for how to socialize, maybe, online. So you don't know, think about that. The last uh, quote from the Bible, and popular quotes, like I organize these in popularity, right, um, is learn to require endurance and encouragement, right? Learning requires both endurance and encouragement. If you are in the process of learning, you're going to need to have both. You're going to need to be able to um, hang in there. You're going to need to be able to be resilient. You're going to need to be strong. But you're also going to need to have faith and hope. And, you know, and sometimes that comes from other people. Sometimes you need somebody else to help you, you know, align yourself to 
the vision to the mission to whatever it is you're trying to get from the learning process so that you will engage in the process full as full as maybe you need somebody like you know um the last couple semesters for kayla you know I, she couldn't feed herself she couldn't do anything she didn't wash anything she didn't do anything she was too busy trying to trying to study trying to work trying to put her research together and do all the things she needed to do and so that's what she leaned on us for and also to get up and get get to work you know and we were able to do that for her because we're all here thanks to COVID-19 to do that so it's very very important that you develop the encouragement from other people the other people can take off the some, some parts of your life take away some of the distractions, you know, and add to what you need to have to encourage you to move you forward so that you don't have any excuses to move forward, right? So people who love you, people who care for you, uh, accountability partners, somebody else, who are you talking about? Who are you talking to about your learning process? Okay, so I'm gonna see, I'm gonna flip back over and see if there's any questions or anything we can, we can do to celebrate our members here and the people that we're talking to. There's Nancy. I could benefit from learning how to construct interactive online classes, webinars for large audiences. Oh my God, Nancy, I am doing exactly the same thing. In fact, I'm taking a series of courses on LinkedIn um, and they're, they're free to me because I purchased the, the bigger package, but um, I will definitely download all the materials that they share with me. Uh, I'm, I'm, Uh, and learning strategies, and let's make sure that I am still here. Um, it looks like I'm having a problem with the video feed, so I'm hoping you guys can still hear me while that's popping back up, but it looks like it just came up uh, that I have a connection somehow that is unstable, and plugging into, what does it say? If you're, good, if you're on Wi-Fi, try to plug it into your router or moving closer to it. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we're going to make it through this session. Unfortunately, I, I'm dealing with an unstable Wi-Fi, but um, thank you for yeah. I will definitely uh, remember to send that to you, Nancy, because that's something I'm working on myself. And all the materials, I promise you, are, are top notch. It's good stuff that they have in these in these LinkedIn courses. Now, you obviously won't be able to take the course and get a certificate, you know, uh, or a, a, some kind of credential or certification for having done it, um, you know. But you know, knowledge is knowledge, and you get it from where you get it. And if you can, if, if it'll help you, then, you know, I'm, I'm on track with that. Um, hi, Cell Rand. What are you talking about, Scott? I don't understand. I do not understand, my friend, what question you are asking or if you're making a statement or what it is that you're trying to communicate. So if you could help me out, that would be tremendous. Um, but what do you guys think about if any of, of the quotes so far of the, of the information that I've been able to get? We're just talking about the Bible so far. Is any of that ring clear to you? Is any of it, um, the, this, if, 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 if any of the, the top 10, you know, quotes from the Bible about learning, does that any of them kind of like the lessons kind of move you? If so, tell me which one, tell me which, not the number, but what do you remember from, you know, what we said and, um, That'll be cool. Um, that'll let me know what's, what, what really resonates with people and what doesn't. Okay, so let's, let's deal with some of the quotes. Um, Gandhi said, live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn as if you were to live forever. Live as if you would die tomorrow and learn as if you would love, or, to, or, or, or learn as if you were to live forever. That one cooked my noodle when I first read it, but it is actually the most popular quote on learning. <laughs> uh, and I realized that in order for you to learn to support that, I'm going to be excited. I'm going to be in energetic. I'm going to be engaged in the right now means you have have already had to build a process. You have already had to build a system and put that in place in order for you to enjoy, literally be able to kick back and smell the roses and know that today is gonna be great because you are empowered and, and emboldened and strengthened with everything you need to make it a great day. 
Now about the living forever and learning and, and how that's going to affect your forever to know that you have a daily rigorous practice of learning and updating your skills, your talents and the information that you take in will give you the confidence that you need to project a future for yourself um, in a way that you could not project a future for yourself if you did not have that constant system of learning. Also, if you don't take care of yourself physically, you're not going to be able to engage in the type of learning that's going to help project you into the future. And I found some examples and some links and some, some stuff to share with you guys that literally suggests that you can reduce your brain age, meaning you can take your brain from wherever it is right now back to where it was 30 years ago in just three months. If you do the right things, if you do the right things physically, if you do the right things mentally, um, if you eat the right foods, if you exercise correctly, if you do the things that you're supposed to do. Drink water, sleep well, exercise regularly, consistently, eat the right food, not carbons, not, not a whole bunch of carbon. Uh, not a whole bunch of sugar, not a whole bunch of, of fat, you know, but try to get as many leafy greens as you possibly can in there. And last, rest, recover, breathe. You got to do these things. If you don't do these things well, then your brain is going to get older and older. Like I said earlier, it takes a lot of energy to run a brain. And it, it shows that a person who is who's living under stress all the time, who is not managing their health holistically and healthily, they don't have very good brain tissue. And so it's not as elastic. Elasticity is not there the way it needs to be um, so that your brain can fully be active and, and, and useful to you. And so you got to take care of your brain. And if you're doing that, then you have you're going to you're going to have you're going to stave off Alzheimer's, number one, number one, and you're going to live a full, actively engaged life because your body will be the best it can be, and it will be able to give the brain the energy it needs to do what it needs to do for you to learn. That's really what, what that's all about. So Dr. Seuss says, the more you read, the more things you will know, the more that you will learn, the more places you will go. You can go anywhere with books. You can go anywhere with lectures from all over the world um, using the internet right now. You can see YouTube videos and have them interpret it for you. Um, you can do a lot with learning. You can read about anything, learn any language. Um, there's always ways to, 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 to participate in every culture that we have written about. Um, it's funny because, you know, some of you know me, you know, my wife works at the Library of Congress and she always tells me it's the world's largest repository of information. Just think about that. The world's largest repository of information for those of us in the Washington metropolitan area is right down the street. <laughs> you know, it's really right down the street. And because they're digitizing the collections, it's at our fingertips as well. And so think about that. Whatever you want to know, whoever you want to know in terms of culture or peoples about anything, you can learn it today. You can learn it. Um, and you, can, you have the ability to, to learn it in ways that you could have never done even 20, 30 years ago. It's all at your fingertips. Use the Internet. Use the World Wide Web. Make it um, what you need it to be in order for you to grow. Yes, it might offer a lot of commercial distractions, but there are ways to make sure that you minimize those that will you know help you to you know, focus in on what you need to focus in. In fact, as I'm talking to you guys right now, I'm fixing the spelling and, 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 and all the stuff in my document. I got to gotta focus on what I'm talking about. OK, um, Einstein says any fool can know the point is to understand. I love that quote. Um, you know, if you think that knowledge is something that is something that you just attain and it has no meaning, it has no purpose, it has nothing behind it that's going to create value in, in yourself and in this world that we live in, then you wasted the whole effort. You know, um, I love people who try to learn stuff so they can hoard it for themselves. <laughs> you know, I got my, that, that whole mentality. I've got mine, so you got to get yours. 
I got a feeling they didn't really learn very much because I know I learn best when I learn for the purpose of sharing it with others. And then I not to embarrass myself, I make sure I do a good job about what I learned is very, very important. And the last quote I'm going to read to you before we get into the neuroscience of it all is from Roy T. Bennett. And Roy Bennett is a popular artist and he writes a lot, a lot popular um, philosopher. He writes a lot about, you know, happiness and joy and love and all that kind of stuff. And he says, the past is a place of reference, not a place of residence. The past is a place of learning, not a place of living. Learning in the vernacular that you need to have it in is something that you need to do to help you live, not just to help you relive <laughs> what happened in the past. You can't stay there. You can't go from there. You can't grow from you can grow from there, but you can't grow back to it because time again is marching forward. So I love these quotes of people say you want to make America great again. At what point do you want to go back and retard our entire nation and keep us from moving forward because you want to continue to live, live backwards and move things in a direction that's not forward, it's backwards. It's not even realistic in, in terms of how you envision time and how you envision the passing of it or the ability of it to do whatever it needs to happen uh, in our world. So I don't know why we want to go, you know, I'm going to make it great again. I would like to make it greater and greater and greater still instead of great again, <laughs> you know, but that's just me. Maybe I'm the only person who has common sense. I don't know. Man. It could be. It could be. It could be. I, I could be the guy. Um, but there's lots of understanding and wisdom out there when it comes to learning. You know, um, I, I've, I pulled up a couple of um, documents and a couple articles that I want to share with you guys. But as I'm sharing them, start thinking about, you know, what they may mean to you. Um, what, what some of the things that may happen. Uh, I found this great uh, TED Talk by a guy named Josh Kaufman. And Josh was talking about the myth of the 10,000 hours. I know you guys have heard the myth that in order for you to get to learn something at a great level, you got to spend 10,000 hours doing it. And I realized that this is like a phone tag. Josh taught me this is pretty much like phone tag, like the original document, the original study of that 10,000 hours was actually to be able to do something rare that most people can't do and to do it in a level of mastery of expert level. So it's like playing a guitar <laughs> or playing tennis or, you know, playing a, 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 not just a musical instrument, but maybe learning a specific uh, segment of rocket science, right? Or something like that. That's a very specific narrow of mastery he's talking about that you had to spend 10,000 hours to get to in practice and learning and reading and practice and learning and reading. You know, it's very, very important. That's not what you need to do to learn something new. That's not what you need to do to learn something to a level where you're just average, where you're just okay, you just got it, right? Where you understand it, it's there. Guess how much slime it takes in reality to just learn something new? Let me see if you, if either one of you all can guess correctly. Let's see. Anybody can guess how many hours or how much time does it take for you to learn something new in reality? Not just not become a master of it, not become one of the best that's ever been at it. Just guess for me how many hours you think it might take. Scott says two thousand. That's good. That's good. What do you say out there, Nancy? You got a, You got a, You got a number for me? It takes as little as 20 hours to learn something new. And here's the process that you have to go through. It's just a four part process. First part of the process is you need to deconstruct the skill that you want to learn and decide what you actually want to be able to do. Right. This goes on the question I already I always ask people that I work with, people that I know. What do you want to be, do, or have as a result of learning whatever it is you're trying to learn? Deconstruct it. 
down to its core competencies, right? And just don't don't worry about all the other fluff, right? Get down to the nits and grits of this thing, right? And then you can you can do it in 20 hours. Learn enough to self-correct. So you need to learn enough that you can literally tell when you're making a mistake. If you can't tell you're making a mistake, then you haven't learned enough, right? You gotta you gotta keep going until you can self-correct, self-diagnose. This is the problem. I'm doing this wrong. This isn't the right supposed to work. If you don't, if you can't figure that out, then you really haven't learned enough. Number three, you got to remove all the barriers to practice. Any distractions. It doesn't matter what the distraction is. It could be the internet. It could be telephone. It could be email. It could be whatever it is, new people talking to you, somebody walking through your office, whatever it is that distracts you when you're in the learning process you need to remove from the learning process. Now, if you're like me, I like a little background noise because a little background noise helps me focus on what I'm trying to learn. But when it comes to actually the practice and the rehearsal of it, I can't have any background noise. The only voice I need to hear is mine or the only thing I need to see is stuff that I produced, right? So it's very, very important that you learn, you know your learning styles, you learn, learn, learn what skills you have to learn. So but while I'm dealing with the road information, while I'm dealing with, you know, the definitions or I'm, I'm, I'm diagramming uh, some of the some of the material that I'm trying to that I'm trying to get my mind around, then I'm definitely going to want to have some background noise because that helps me stay focused. But that can't be something new. Right. It can't be new noise. And what I mean by that is. It has to be something that I'm familiar with. So I'm so familiar with most like classic jazz and stuff like that. So I have that playing in the background. But if you bring a new song that has lyrics and a different kind of beat or rhythm into it, that might distract me. So I don't I don't try to do with the, the new, more popular stuff. I do with the classic oldies, right? The things that the, the things that I could eat that, that won't distract me because I already have a memory for that. And it sort of it, fo- it forces me to focus and think about what I'm thinking about right now. But different people are different. You know, what, what is it that you need to do to remove the barriers that's out there for you that keep in your when you're learning, when you're truly trying to learn something, what barriers or distractions are there that you have to remove? Go ahead and type it in the chat. Let's see what we come up with. Um, last quote I want to share with you is this one. This one's from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who says the love of learning, the sequestered nooks, and all the sweaty, all the sweet serenity of books. The love of learning, the sequestered nooks, and all the sweet serenity of books. Wadfellow is reminding, Longfellow is reminding us, Wadfellow is crazy, Longfellow is reminding us that books can be tedious, they can be hard, they can take time, effort, energy, it can be mind breaking. In, in, in terms of, you know, the effort to to read and learn and read from what somebody else is saying. Um, a lot of reasons why is because um, sometimes when, you, when you're learning what somebody else is from what somebody else is writing, you're reading past and through their style. You're reading past and through uh, their phrases and the terminologies and there might be a different word choice that you would make or there might be a different a level of or elevation of the language in terms of the vocabulary that you may or may not be used used to. And so, you know, sometimes I guess when I, you know, I'm re- I remember when I originally started learning stuff, I really had to have a dictionary at my side. It's like, what does that word mean? So I don't have to skim stuff, you know, right ahead or ahead of time for words I don't know. And then I have to go dig out those words and try to look at the try to try to understand those words before I read it again for any detail. And then I would now now it makes sense to me because the vocabulary is not over my head anymore. So oftentimes you have to pull out the vocabulary lesson right before you can actually understand what it is that you're reading. <laughs> and um, you know, but do whatever you need to do. But you're gonna love learning once you start to unlock the barriers again. Get rid of the barriers. That can, a barrier could be in vocabulary. By the way, we talked about the barriers, but that could be one of the, one of the barriers. If you're trying to learn something that's complicated, that's detailed, that's in a high level of expertise. There's going to be a new vocabulary that comes along with that, and you've got to wrestle with that vocabulary. If you're not willing to wrestle with the vocabulary, you're not going to learn the material. You're not going to learn the information. You certainly aren't going to love it. And that's what you're going for. You're going for a love of learning. So make sure you put the time in in the real active engagement all the way. Give it everything you got. 
upskilling has a definition. I'm going to share that with you. Um, upskilling is a term, one of those terms that you get from the workplace, right? And um, it's a workplace trend that facilitates continuous learning by providing training programs and developmental opportunities that expand abilities and minimize skill gaps. Organizations all over the planet are trying to do this. They're trying to define and relate to this term upskilling. They're trying to make sure that their people know exactly what they need to know. They train them to what they need to know. So they're competent and they're great at what they need to know, but not a whole bunch more. They just want to expand your abilities to do what they need you to do. And they want to minimize the skill gaps that they have seen. Later on, you're going to know why this is important uh, and, and why we've been talking about this. Because, you know, the current literature is replete with skill gaps, you know, all over the workplace. People are talking about it. Executives are mad about it. They're, they're not having they're not enjoying the fact that they can't find people to do the work that needs to be done. In fact, studies show and I'm going to skip right to some of those facts real quick. Studies show that 72 percent of executives in the world are upset because they can't find people that have two things, the ability to adapt and the ability to learn. And they need people to do that. They need people to be willing to do that. And it's the, it, it, another fact that juxtaposes that fact that's really important, too, is that 74 percent of the people who are out there don't feel like they're living up to their potential in the workplace. So 72 percent of the leaders saying I can't find people who have the ability to adapt and learn. And then 74 percent of people who are working say I can't uh, I don't feel like I'm living up to my potential in the workplace. There's a there's a there's an opportunity there. There's an opportunity there for for training and development to take its rightful place at the top of any and every organization. Because if you're, you know, uh, another study shows that, you know, modernization is making many skills that we used to say was uh, were amazing, they're becoming obsolete. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but writing cursive is no longer taught in most of our school systems. It's glossed over but it's not something that children have to learn how to do anymore. It's not something that they don't have to do because cursive was a way of, of shorthanding and getting the, the text down really quickly without having to focus on the formation of the letters and you know the correct you know spacing of the letters and so forth. You could just, just keep writing, you never have to pick your pen up. And it was a way to shortcut and be more effective with writing as people were speaking, taking notes, you want to do that. And, you know, if you couldn't, if you didn't know shorthand, you certainly wanted to write them down in cursive because it was faster than trying to write block letters. Right. It just made it made it more efficient. You can get more text. You can get more information. You can get more down and your thoughts can flow faster if you can write in cursive. Well, now it's becoming less and less of a problem or a lot less and less of an issue. And so schools are not even dealing with it. They're just like, OK. Here's what cursive, we used to talk about cursive back in the day. We used to force you to write these letters and all that kind of stuff. But now you don't really have to. You just have to know. You have to be familiar with it, what it looks like. So my daughter right now can't write cursive. She can't. And nobody in her generation, nobody in her school. And she was amongst the top students in her in her curriculum coming up through you know, K through 12. And so think about that. You know, what, what does that mean? Other skills in the workplace that we used to value or no longer value. People have the skills, but they're not worth anything anymore. They're becoming obsolete. And that's happening. If you if you look at, you know, um, I used to study workforce uh, learning statistics. And it just shows up that, you know, over and over again for the last decade, people have been losing what now they call soft skills. They can't communicate effectively anymore. They don't know how. They don't know the work. They don't know how to choose the right words. Um, and as we introduce more and more at varying cultures, it becomes more and more difficult to communicate in the workplace. And, and and I'm not suggesting that we don't add those new cultures, but I am suggesting that understand that the more difficult it becomes to communicate, the more you have to do to fix that difficulty. That becomes a skill gap. 
in the workplace. And that, that's going to kill innovation and creativity. If you need that in order to move forward, guess what? You're going to have to do some more training. You have to do some more understanding. You have to do some more development work, right? The last statistic I want to share with you that it suggests that when organizations are all about learning and development, when they have a learning culture in the organization that's hardwired into the organization, it's expected, it's appreciated, and it's hardwired, the people in that organization produce 52% more than those who do not. And so organizations used to try to grow their bottom line by cutting costs. They figured they're producing all they can produce. And so let's figure out what we can do to cut costs and streamline the costs and so on and so forth. And then that will add more productivity or at least add more profitability to the existing productivity. But often in order to really raise the raise the raise the opportunity for an organization to be successful, it has to increase its productivity. It cannot do it if people cannot keep up with the new, the great, the important, the relevant stuff that has to be learned in today's modern workforce. I can't stress that enough. If you want to move forward in your life, you have to demonstrate that the skills that are in the gap that most of us have, that you can move through that gap pretty well. It's critically, critically important can't do that, then, you know, I got to tell you that um, you're going to be suffering. And so continuous learning is very important, not just learning what you need to learn for your particular industry, because by the way, that's old news. You need to be a futuristic in your thinking. You need to be um, thinking about where is the industry going? I love this uh, quote from Wayne Gretzky. Gretzky, I guess, Gretzky. Wayne, he's a famous hockey player, but he always said, you know, I want to be where the puck is going, not where the puck is. You want to be where the learning is going, not where the learning is. Now, you can learn a lot from the past. Don't get me wrong. You need to learn the fundamental basics of whatever it is your thing is. But you also have to learn the trajectory of it and where it's going. And you need to be at the forefront of that information so that you will always be relevant. Critically important, Nancy said that um, one of the learning gaps, the skill gaps people have is uh, meeting facilitation. Folks aren't hard to do that successfully. That is so true. Folks aren't hard how to have a meeting, <laughs> how to work with, how to collaborate, how to coordinate collaboration, how to do anything that moves a team forward. Because, you know, we're living in this individualistic bubble, like we don't need each other. And we need each other like we need to breathe, but we don't acknowledge it very well. And so therefore, we don't sharpen those skills. Teamwork is not something that we specifically um, learn and develop. I remember the first time, you know, uh, I took a quantitative analysis class and it required a group project. We had to work as a team. And we literally had to divide the work up and put it back together, trusting that each other would do, each other of us would do our parts. If we didn't do that, then it was gonna, we're, we're all gonna fail. We're all we're gonna get an A or we're all gonna fail. That's kind of how that worked, right? And then I learned that, you know what? This ability to trust people is a thing. It's a skill, <laughs> you know, it's a talent that if you don't have it, then you're gonna try to micromanage. If you're one of, one of those people on, your, on that kind of team, you're gonna try to micromanage everybody on the team which is going to drive people crazy. And people don't learn under duress very well. <laughs> because when you're trying to learn something and you're stressed out, either because of the time crunch or because somebody else is putting pressure on you or somebody's trying to outclass you or whatever, they just don't work well with other people. That is um, very difficult and cannot be sustained long term. There's a reason why people want to be on the winning team. Winners always want to be on the winning team. Losers don't care so much. 
they like to they like to be able to let somebody else do the work for them. I love that. Love what you said, Nancy. Yeah, because lots of people do not do their parts. That's true. Um, we seek the least common denominator often, and we shouldn't. Sometimes we should we should seek the hard road, the hard high road, um, versus the low easy road. But that's not natural in human function. So we have to force that. It requires discipline. You know, it requires focus. It requires effort. And that's what this module is all about. And so when I finish this training module, you guys, there's a lot to learn, a lot to share. I know you got to go, Nancy, but I, I appreciate it. Um, there's a couple exercises I want to share with you, you, you guys who are hanging in. Uh, I've got some some real humdingers here that I've gleaned from all the lessons that we we took from. And um, I'm going to start with this. Clearly, the knowledge uh, exists for you to learn anything that you need to learn. The question is, are you up for the challenge? What can you do to strengthen your physical, emotional, and mental health regularly? This is the must-do opportunity for you, right? Your brain takes up a lot of energy to run, higher functions, and if your health is compromised, it will be difficult for your brain to actually do this. In fact, studies show that with the right wellness programs, you can actually reduce your brain age and massively increase your cognitive abilities. This is, I got a lot of links about this in the document that I'm preparing for you guys. So. Uh, make sure I get it to you, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll definitely get it to you when I finish it. Probably finish it this weekend. So think about that. Do you have a clearly established weekly daily system for you to update your skills and learn new ones? Have you have you established some kind of daily, weekly, monthly learning activity goals? Uh, you found accountability partners that are vested have a vested interest in your success. Who knows that you're developing new skills that really matter to you and your business? Is it a future investor? Is it uh, a, a business partner? Is it uh, an advisory council member? Is it your corporate board level membership? You know, who knows that you're trying to develop some new skills that you're trying and, and, and it's going to matter to them. It's going to matter to the organization. It's going to matter to their business because they can do things. Who can endorse you? Who can um, who's the kind of person that needs to know that you have this new talent once, once it's acquired? So they can they can use you and, and provide the you can provide the value to them that makes a significant difference. Okay, because people often don't know that they have a problem until you show them there's a solution. And I know that's not necessarily what you want to always do, but it's hard to sometimes get recognition for what you don't show that you have quality, a uh, quality understanding of. And you have to find it. Sometimes you have to manufacture opportunities to show that. Um, that may be a, a sales meeting. It might be some other type of, of, of place where you can demonstrate your expertise and your talent. But I would suggest to you, if you're going to learn something, also learn and figure out a way to manufacture a place to perform this new skill that others that are relevant in the space can see you performing this new skill. Because that is going gonna, is gonna to be how they, they see you. It's going to be how they notice you. It's going to be how you get a chance to um, excel. This is why people always want to be in speaking engagements. They always want to be in front of crowds sharing what they know because the, the chances are you can literally invite people to your speaking engagement that you want to have see you anyway. Instead of, and that's one less customer you got to go fight for because they'll already know that you're talented and you already have the expertise and you're going to jump right in the boat when you ask them to. Next thing you want to do is you always want to assess your talent trajectory. You want to assume that when you learn a new skill at a high level, that you'll be able to be, do, and have whatever it is you may be. That vision of what you're going to be, do, and have as a result of acquiring the skill is going to be a part of your motivation. It's going to be part of what, what helps you to keep moving forward in this thing. Like Lancey was talking about putting together uh, an online course. Well, I'm trying to learn to do the same thing because I'm already in talks with two organizations to put together a massive online community course, to put a massive course online that's going to be seen and, and taken by hundreds of people, all hundreds of thousands of people, I'm sorry, all over the world. <laughs> you know, I want um, to be able to do that for small businesses and make sure that they, that, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm developing the expertise, but I'm going to need, after I develop the expertise, right, I'm going to need sponsors. 
I'm going to need people who are going to be willing to, to jump in with me and, and let me lead them through this curriculum development process and then through the implementation of it when it's all said and done. It's going to be amazing. So it's very, very important that I develop this skill. Not because I want to have to, I want to be able to master it. I don't want to be the master of it. I just want to be familiar enough that I can be conversant with other people who do curriculum design, who do online courses. So when I recruit them into this opportunity, I know what I'm talking about. When they start talking to me, they know I know what I'm talking about, and I know what they're talking about. And we can we can develop a connection fairly quickly, and it can make things go. But if I try to do this out of ignorance. You can see it's not going to go in the right, in the good place, right? I mean, it's common sense. So assess your talent trajectory. Ask the, the questions. You know, who's going to benefit from this thing? What kind of personal productivity are you going to be able to generate because of it? How much increase are you looking for? You know, when it comes to your particular productivity, you know, who's going to appreciate it and who might pay you for it? Um, with, there, there are things that you can think about um, to make that work real a lot better. What will it feel like to win in an industry, uh, an industry award, or what would it feel like to be nominated? Have you thought about that? Think about it. If you were the best at, at one of the best at what you do, and you were nominated for the award in your industry, how, what what are the qualifications? What are the, what are the requirements? Do you meet those? Can you learn to meet those? Can you can you can you grow in those areas? If you can, what's it going to be like to know, you know, without question, that you're one of the best of the best, and everybody else knows it. You know, which is really cool when your peers say, you know what, if I need to learn something, I'm going to call this person. I'm, I'm going to really go after it. And, and, and I know that they can help. They can help and they can share with me and they can share with me what they know because they're already doing it. Right. They've already been caught doing it. It's very, very important. You want to catch you want to catch yourself doing the good stuff about, you know, pr preserving your industry, uh, preserving your knowledge and growing your information so that you become one of the greats. Who should be on your advisory council? Very critical part of your learning process. If these people have, some people have already made it to the top of the game that you're playing, whatever the game is that you're playing, they need to be the people that give you advice on how to get better. And you can't really kind of make that up on your own because it requires you to read a lot of books, a lot of information that may or may not be useful. Why not just go to the top of the game? and get that information from them. Find out what books they read, find out what strategies they use, find out what processes and programs they believe in, and then figure out how you can adopt them. If you can't afford them, figure out how you can you can, you can acquire them in another way. Maybe you can volunteer um, to participate. You know, um, and that's what I work for books, right? <laughs> you know, or do whatever you need to do to grow. But think about it. It's, you know, people don't want to hoard information. They don't want to have you um, they don't want to leave you ignorant. They don't want to leave you in, in a place where, you know, they have information and they know they have information and you don't have information, but you need it or you want it for a, a, a very good reason. People will share with you what they have. You just have to be willing to articulate the need, um, you know, and they won't make you run through the course, through, through, the, through the gauntlet, you know, to, to get ready where you want to go. Um, because oftentimes they've already done that and seen that this is not the way to go. The other way to go is this way. So let me show you that instead of what I had to do, which is not useful. It didn't work, right? So you know, think about that. You know, always think about who you can talk to about it. How who 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 could be on your advisory council? Who could you uh, just spend a few minutes just picking their brain about this thing before you jump in? Because once you jump in, like I said earlier, you got to give it everything. You got to go all the way. Um, and I mean, go all the way in terms of your commitment to learn, you know, just a little bit of time every day. Um, and, and that's going to mean a lot to where you're able to go, and where you're able to grow. Okay, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, I have had a wonderful time. It is about 410. We have had a great, great opportunity in front of us. Um, and next week, I, again, I don't know what I'm going to talk about, but I'll be announcing it pretty soon. <laughs> Follow me on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on YouTube, and I hope you had a great time. Bye now.